Szanowni Państwo, jest mi strasznie miło przywitać Państwa na kolejnym wykładzie pana profesora Johna Matesona. Przypomnę tym z, państwu, z Państwa, którzy, którzy jeszcze go nie mieli przyjemności poznać, że pan profesor Matheson jest naszym gościem ze Stanów Zjednoczonych, z City University of New York, gdzie pracuje jako Distinguished Professor w John Jay College of Criminal Justice. No i pan profesor Matheson jest zdobywcą Nagrody Policera, znamienitym biografem, który prowadzi ten nasz projekt pod tytułem Metropolia Metropolii pod egidą Górnośląskiej Metropolii GZM. Ta współpraca Metropolii GZM, Uniwersytetu Śląskiego oraz Fantastycznej Biblioteki Śląskiej dała w efekcie ten cykl otwartych wykładów, które są tłumaczone na język polski symultanicznie. Chciałem przy tym Państwu przypomnieć, że dla tych z Państwa, którzy wolą słuchać wersji oryginalnej, działa w tym momencie kanał Biblioteki Śląskiej YouTube'owy. Wystarczy wejść na kanał YouTube Biblioteki Śląskiej, wówczas będziecie Państwo mieli dostęp do wykładu pana profesora Matesona w oryginale bez mojego tłumaczenia. Ci z Państwa, którzy wolą słuchać po polsku, mogą słuchać tego wykładu przez kanał facebookowy Biblioteki Śląskiej, gdzie nadawany jest ten wykład na żywo. Oczywiście serdecznie zapraszamy do zadawania pytań. Te pytania będą pojawiały się na ekranie. Ja je będę tłumaczyć panu profesorowi Matesonowi na, pod, koniec, pod koniec tego wykładu. Dobrze? Szanowni Państwo, jest mi niezmiernie miło podziękować całej fantastycznej ekipie Biblioteki Śląskiej, dzięki której ta transmisja dwukanałowa jest możliwa i panu dyrektorowi Biblioteki Śląskiej, panu profesorowi Zbigniewowi Kadłubkowi, który nam tę współpracę także umożliwił. A teraz, jeżeli Państwo pozwolicie, skrótowo powtórzę to samo po angielsku dla osób słuchających tego wykładu w języku angielskim, a następnie przejdziemy już do samego wykładu pana profesora Matesona. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great, great honor for me to uh, uh, welcome you to the second public open lecture by Professor John Madison. Professor John Madison uh, is a distinguished professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of the City University of New York. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, an eminent biographer, and a brilliant, fantastic friend of mine and my mentor as well. The, uh, the, the, the project that we're realizing, Metropolis for Metropolis, uh, is sponsored by the Upper Silesian Metropolis and uh, um, is realized in the collaboration between uh, uh, the University of Silesia in Karavica, uh, the Silesian Library in Karavica, and the Silesian Metropolis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, those of you who prefer to listen to Professor John Madison's lecture without any disturbance on my part, because the lecture is going to be uh, interpreted simultaneously. Uh, uh, those of you who'd like to listen to the original version of, uh, of the lecture, you're most welcome to enter the YouTube channel of the Library of Silesia, of the Silesian Library in Karavica, where uh, one stream, the English stream, is going to be uh, uh, delivered. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without much further ado, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us. Do not hesitate to ask questions under underneath uh, uh, um, uh, the, the window um, with Professor Madison's lecture. Uh, those questions will then be projected onto the screen. I'll be able to read them to Professor Madison, whether in Polish or in English. And at the end uh, of our meeting, uh, Professor Madison is, is going to try uh, and, and respond to them as fully as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much uh, uh, for being with us this evening, uh, and I give you Professor John Madison. Professor Madison, the floor is yours. Forgive me, I was waiting for a verbal cue that apparently I don't require, so thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you indeed, Professor Yunjeko, and my thanks as well to the splendid technical team that is making this bilingual uh, broadcast possible. And, um, and uh, also to um, uh, the uh, Upper Silesian Metropolis, University of Silesia, and the Library of Silesia. Thank you all for your uh, assistance and cooperation.
In bookstores, biographies are alphabetized by subject, uh, not by author. Uh, this practice speaks eloquently and somewhat sadly of the position of the biographer in the world of letters. It reflects the assumption, typically accurate, that the identity of the biographer matters far less to the public than uh, that of her subject. Uh, yet it also reinforces the prejudice, scandalously false, that the biographer is not fully deserving of recognition as a literary artist and that her work is not truly creative. Now, there's no denying that the art of the biographer lies only secondarily in innovation and new construction. Its chief functions are retrieval and reconstruction. It is a peculiar form of aesthetic endeavor because it seems to strive against originality. It tells old stories more often than it tells new ones. A typical reader may understandably presume that a biography is simply a restatement of past realities, telling of things that were, uh, as, uh, that were as opposed to bringing forth anything uh, distinctly new. Um, it is the subjects of the biography, after all, who created the story through their words and deeds. It appears at first glance that the biographer merely offered a summary. Uh, readers typically find what they're looking for. They come to a novel or to a poem expecting to be entertained by the author's facility with language, storytelling, or skillful manipulations of rhythms and metaphors. Although no surveys on the subject have been taken, my subjective experience has convinced me that most readers of biographies are not looking for subtleties of structure or refinement of expression, and therefore they tend not to notice them. Logically speaking, there is nothing to prevent a biographer from painstakingly crafting every sentence of a 400-page book into the most aesthetically pleasing creation that it can become. But the incentives may have the against doing such meticulous work. Time is, after all, money, and editors want pages as fast as the writer can produce them. Artistic craft is one of the things most deadened by a deadline. And if the biographer does make the effort to intertwine artistry with her storytelling, the rewards are likely to be underwhelming, usually little more than the crumb of approval that a reviewer tosses onto the floor when he uses without elaboration the adjective well-written. The Victorian literary critic Matthew Arnold said that in poetry, the idea is the fact. In biography, the fact stands above the idea, and it often threatens to crowd out the artistry altogether. In addition to bringing low expectations to the reading of a biography, the lay reader is also likely to presume that truth speaks with a single voice. He is therefore inclined to suppose that biographers are unoriginal because he knows that a biographer is bound to narrate the truth about the subject. And this requirement does, of course, exist. The modern biographer who invents dialogue, who repeats apocryphal stories under the guise of fact, who accords full credence to questionable or discredited sources, is universally and justly condemned. This insistence on fidelity to truth can create the impression that the biographer is not an artist, but merely a belated reporter one who discovers and relates facts with detached and clinical neutrality. This presumed disengagement is also a leading reason why biography, unlike drama, poetry, and the novel, has never prompted critics to evolve an extensive body of aesthetic theory in relation to it. Um, it may be reasonably argued as well that because every human subject of a biography is different, no unifying poetics can be proposed that will be pertinent to every biography or indeed even any two biographies. And yet, I find there's no reason why the genre should remain devoid of aesthetic constructs and philosophical frameworks. Although biography demands the diligence and precision of a craft, it also calls for the inventiveness and dexterity of an art. I shall argue today that it should be considered as such. I don't know whether the saying I'm about to share has crossed the uh, Atlantic Ocean. In America, however, at one time or another, 
Most biographers have heard the bromide, a biographer is a novelist under oath. It's not a bad definition, and we should examine it. The spirit of the novelist, much more than the strictures of the oath, is the part that demands most close and critical attention. Uh, most, though by no means all, biographies are written about dead subjects. Thus, the typical reconstructive task of a biographer is to restore flesh to a skeleton, to give the appearance of life and multidimensionality to a person who now can be known only through writings, recordings, and if the subject is a recent one, the recollections of survivors. Part of the biographer's mission is to save as much as possible from oblivion. Working as a biographer leads one naturally to reflect on how quickly the presence of a recently deceased person typically fades from memory. Someone in relatively close proximity to us, uh, let's say a neighbor or a co-worker, uh, feels deliciously, deliciously vivid and three-dimensional while still living. Yet the vividness can promptly vanish when the friend or colleague dies, dwindling to a few fragments and anecdotes. He spoke Greek. He was a Giants fan. He drove a red car. Physical death precedes a second death, also tragic in its own way, as the remembered parts of a person slowly vanish. It is not only the annals of the poor that are short and simple, and the percentage of the world's people whose lives persist in more than a few lines is lamentably tiny. Reflections like these make the biographer's task feel all the more urgent. One cannot adequately restore a biographical subject to life merely by reciting a litany of facts. Inescapably, the biographer turns toward narrative, and writing an engaging narrative necessarily calls for artifact. There is no such thing as a factual record without gaps. To render the story of the life, the biographer must address these lacunae, which, as we shall see, is an intellectually risky process. Even the most scrupulously documented biography risks committing errors on almost every page. A source's memory may be faulty, and crucial letters may have been lost or carelessly transcribed. It may well be impossible for anyone to construct a story of any kind without fictionalizing. And this principle holds as true in biography as it does in the novel. The difference is that the novelist creates material to support the narrative. The biographer shapes the narrative around the available facts. The nature of those facts determines to a large extent the kind of story that can be told. It is no accident that the biography of a writer who kept a journal and who sent and received hundreds of preserved letters will generally make for a richer, more nuanced reading than the life of a painter who left no papers. But the difference does not depend solely on the heft or quality of the available material. Different subjects attract different authors. A writer is apt to be portrayed by another professional writer, who knows something not only about writing, but also about how writers live. The painter is likely to be chosen as a subject by an art historian, someone whose knowledge of artistic tropes, materials, and techniques may, but certainly need not necessarily, far exceed his or her gift for storytelling. There are considerably more great biographies of writers than of painters, precisely because there are many more biographers who understand writing and who write well, then there are verbally gifted biographers who know about visual art. The biographer, if she's a good one, does not lie deliberately. However, unless the biographer is content to churn out a cold, lifeless fact dump of a book, she must consider and strike a balance between truth and what uh, Svet uh, Svetan Todorov in his writings on the novel has called verisimilitude. In the Poetics of Prose, Todorov observes that verisimilitude has various definitions. The most basic definition is to be consistent with reality. Under this definition, certain actions, certain attitudes, are said to lack verisimilitude when they seem unable to occur in reality. We speak of a work's verisimilitude, writes Todorov, insofar as the work tries to convince us that it conforms to reality 
and not to its own laws. However, as is also true of the novelist, the biographer has a subtler form of verisimilitude with which to attempt. She is compelled to ask not only what is consistent with objective reality, but also what is consistent with the subjective reality that a community of readers carried around in their heads, an unspoken consensus as to what is likely to have happened in a given circumstance. Verisimilitude, says Todorov, is a matter of public opinion. Verisimilitude, then, is a gray area between truth and fabrication, where popular judgments as to what is possible and probable quietly displace and masquerade as certainty. I'd like to offer an example from my own recent work. A considerable portion of my just published book, A Worse Place Than Hell, concerns the fortunes of a Union Army chaplain named Arthur Fuller, who was killed at the Battle of Fredericksburg in the American Civil War. Several years before the war, the Reverend Fuller found himself in a railway carriage a few feet away from then-president-elect Franklin Pierce and his wife and son. The train, moments later, crashed, sending the car rolling down a hill and killing Pierce's son. Now, as a general student and aficionado of American history, I had known about this accident for many years, though the fact that Fuller was riding in the Pierce's car was for me a fascinating new discovery. As I began the research on which I would base my description of the scene, I felt a slightly morbid excitement. I looked forward to describing the terrified shrieks of the passengers as they were tossed about in the tumbling car. However, I encountered a surprise when I read Fuller's letters. In his narration of the accident, Reverend Fuller notes very specifically that as the carriage careened down the hillside, no one uttered a sound. Everyone was too shocked to cry out. As a matter of narration, I was instantly thankful for the detail of the passenger's silence. It adds, in my view, a kind of unanticipated spectral horror to the scene, which I was thankful to include. However, I was led to reflect on how easily I could have gotten that detail wrong. It had seemed quite natural and obvious to me that passengers trapped in a derailed airborne train car would scream lustily. Had I not read Fuller's letter, I think there's a good chance that I would have made some mention of screaming passengers in my book, because that detail would have comported with my own idea of verisimilitude, as well as, I surmise, uh, with the expectations of my reader. Imagine, if you will, by the way, the same scene uh, represented not in a book, but in a film. The cries of horror would then be requisite. If the scene were presented without them, audience members might actually complain that the silence was unreal. Note, however, that the reaction would differ if the scene were presented with a voiceover from the actor playing Fuller, saying something like, I shall never forget a most stunning fact. As the train rolled down the embankment, not a sound escaped from any passenger. They were too horrified even to scream. Fuller's words would suffice to bring the silence back within the pale of verisimilitude, and the audience would likely then accept it without a murmur. My point is this, that a novelist, much more than a biographer, can afford to play freely with verisimilitude because, to a great extent, the author of fiction creates his world. The factual authority for his writing emerges from his own imagination, not from an actual written record. The fiction writer may be bound to observe you know, historical chronologies or laws of physics, and yet his freedom is nevertheless quite substantial. Biographers perpetually worry that immediately after they publish, a newly discovered stack of documents will overthrow their theory of their subject. Such potential catastrophes do not exist for a novelist. William Faulkner never had to live in dread that a letter would someday surface establishing that Quentin Compson was murdered instead of dying by suicide. We may object that a scene in a novel is improbable or unrealistic. However, we can never produce the evidence that the incident never happened, for the very reason that, paradoxically, it never did. Fiction 
is the untruth that can never be shown to be untrue. By contrast, the biographer must accept a given world as she finds it, a world defined by historic records, but also defined by their ambiguity or ambiguity or their absence. Uh, she describes an actual world as it once existed. Nevertheless, all the work of establishing verisimilitude has not been done for her. If she's to make that actual world seem actual, she has to recreate it in a convincingly realistic way. Part of a biography's verisimilitude arises from incontrovertible facts, those parts of the historical record on which all reasonable people agree. A biography's adherence to these facts establishes its basic reliability. Another part of the biography's verisimilitude stands on shiftier ground. Those issues of fact on which the sources disagree and which may be variously accepted or rejected. The biographer's credibility depends on her capacity to choose rationally among the contradictory accounts and to argue convincingly in support of her decision. One becomes caught between competing multiple truths. Arguably, the biographer's most crucial task is establishing similitude. Um, and yet, um, this, this task calls for a different skill from those already mentioned. The record of a subject's life is rarely, if ever, as complete as the biographer requires in order to make the story feel like a story. To fill the gaps, the biographer must make inferences and suppositions. She must supply the narrative that arranges the facts into a work that, in places, begins to feel very much like a novel. Indeed, because her readers' ideas of verisimilitude, as well as her own, have likely been conditioned by a lifetime of novel reading, the biographer's suppositions and interpretations are likely to be more convincing the more novelistic they happen to be. And novelistic expectations are likely to be somewhat sensationalized. Hence, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, a biographer is more likely to fill Arthur Fuller's tumbling passenger car with shrieking passengers than with stunned silent ones. Another problem for the biographer's attempts to retell the subject's life in realistic fashion lies in the nature of historical evidence. The preserved truth is only accidentally the important truth. A biographer's task is shaped by the available sources, and those sources have made their own judgments as to what details were worth preserving. Sources record only what they find most interesting, and thus the record of a subject's life naturally tends to contain more drama than the life that was actually lived. Moreover, the stories that witnesses tell will commonly be shaped by their notions of what made the subject important. The aspects of life that mattered most to the subject may be utterly ignored by a source because they do not seem to bear upon the subject's fame or legacy. It is entirely possible that the things that truly matter most to a person exist only in that person's secret thoughts and feelings, locked away in a place where no one will ever find them. Possibly the greatest film ever made about biography is not uh, often acknowledged as being about biography at all. It is Orson Welles's Citizen Kane, in which a gang of reporters scurry about trying to discover the inner truth about Charles Foster Kane. Now, each one of us, I would argue, has not only one hidden rosebud, but several buried in places that no archaeologist could ever disturb. This, then, is to suggest that biography hinges on an impossibility. One may safely assume that most readers pick up a biography because they've heard something, however vague or even erroneous, about the subject's outward actions in the world of phenomena. But it is the noumenal self that the reader hopes to glimpse, the person as person who is finally unknowable. In the actual text of the biography, the greatest value is not typically found in the subject's bare accomplishments. A short timeline would serve that purpose just as well. 
The value that matters most in reading a biography is the value that the subject carries within himself or herself, her ideas, her ethics, feelings, motivations, and inner contradictions. The richest biographical subjects are those who recognize themselves as a source of unfolding reality, those who translate their inner selves most effectively into observable actions and words. The life itself becomes a work of literature in utero to the extent that one accepts and undertakes the obligation to become the author of one's self, of one's own story. An eminent and normally reliable American literary scholar has somewhat flippantly posited, and I quote, no life has an arc. A life is a series of events and then you die. Well, that assertion is clever, but it's very much mistaken. Lives do have arcs and trajectories, not merely as a biographer writes them, but as we live them. Again, I have not taken a survey, but I would argue that consciously or unconsciously, most of us have in our heads an ongoing narrative of our lives. Our expectations for the future are shaped and conditioned by what we've learned from our experiences already, from our observations of others, and indeed from stories we have been told. The Cinderella complex is only one example. We absorb fictions and attempt to realize them in our own existence. Both consciously and unconsciously, we establish patterns for ourselves. We come to terms with what Todorov calls the laws and conventions of the life around us. We make choices in conformity with those inner narratives and thereby impart arc and directedness to our lives. To suppose that no great person has ever felt guided by a sense of destiny to suppose that no one has ever lived life according to an inner guiding narrative is to have, I think, an inattentive knowledge of both history and human nature. In life, as in biography and as in the novel, action reveals character. Henry James's rhetorical questions, posited long ago in The Art of Fiction, shed much light here. Quote, what is character but the determination of incident? What is incident but the illustration of character? What is either a picture or a novel that is not of character? What else do we seek in it and find in it?" Unquote. Similarly, biographical narrative achieves nothing if it does not, page by page, gesture by gesture, proclaim a personality. If then there is no arc, if the actions and events of a life lack a kind of cohesion and logic, then neither the personality who initiates those actions and experiences those effects um, uh, it can be said to possess a narratable self. Events understood only as random points can yield only a chaotic, disordered portrait of a human being. The biographer has a dual identity. She is expected to be both a scrupulous custodian of facts and an entertaining storyteller. In one sense, the biographer's necessary adherence to fact creates a freedom that is denied to the novelist, a freedom explained by the cliché that truth is stranger than fiction. When supported by fact, biography need not make sense with regard to dramatic conventions and expectations. Deus ex machina that would be rejected in fiction occur in real life all the time. Yet at the same time, a biographer may well find a more appreciative audience if she employs novelistic conventions, a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter, a sense of rising and falling action, catastrophe, catharsis. The remarkable thing is that biography feels more believable and in some alchemic way may actually come nearer to truth when it employs the art of a novelist. And this is true not only because the reader's sensibilities have been conditioned by the influence of novels, but also precisely because we think of our own truths in novelistic terms as stories with a rise and fall, strewn with repeated themes. A good biographer, then, is conscious of the human desire for self-authorship and the need for both biographer and subject 
to construct a life that makes narrative sense. Yet limits must be observed, and in large part because lives do not unfold in true teleological fashion. As the poet observes in Ecclesiastes, time and chance happeneth unto all, and the power of any biographical protagonist to shape her or his own life narrative is conditioned by numberless, unforeseeable forces. Thus, in articulating the arc of a subject's life, one needs to preserve the sense of unpredictability and surprise that forms a part of life itself. Thus, the biographer of the subject who dies in an unexpected and notorious fashion takes on an especially tricky, perhaps impossible, assignment. She must write without anticipating the denouement with which all her readers are doubtlessly familiar, and present that ending in a way that somehow recreates the astonishment of a death that is no longer shocking or surprising. Editors of biographies wisely caution their authors against foreshadowing, as this practice shatters the presumption that the subject's future is unknowable, even to the writer. The inner narrative, driven by pure ambition and desire, inevitably alters when it meets with resistance in the world of phenomena. The clash between inner drives and resistant reality is, of course, the fundamental condition of the novel. It's also the fundamental condition of biography. Because novels and biographies operate similarly in the ways that their protagonists confront opposition, a poetics of biography cannot differ entirely from a poetics of the novel. As uh, intimated by my observations thus far, the biographer must work within a realm of incompletion, uh, one uh, in which details at one level or another have been lost to memory. The most scrupulous recorder of a conversation, for instance, may well neglect to note whether the subject has taken off his coat or his interlocutor has put away his reading glasses. Thus, uh, because the novelist is at liberty to manufacture endless details, the novelist can create a more layered and nuanced world than uh, can the fact-bound biographer. The novelist also enjoys the still more important freedom to imagine and explore the unspoken mental states of the protagonist, whereas the biographer may only infer a state of mind from the subject's outer appearance and behavior. But if the novelist and the biographer confront incompleteness in radically different ways, it's still this shared experience of incompleteness that creates their common ground as artists. More than a hundred years ago, in the theory of the novel, Georg uh, Lukács um, argued that the key distinction between a novel and an epic is that the epic hero inhabits a world of reassuring oneness and totality in which the soul is not divided against itself and the individual is spiritually at one with the surrounding cosmos. The epic spirit, spirit says Lukács, does not yet know any abyss within itself. The hero of the novel, on the other hand, lives in a fragmented, contingent world, one where there can be no spontaneous totality. Um, and in, inescapably, to exist in the world of a novel means to be inwardly conflicted and existentially alone. Uh, Lukács' insistence upon this separateness, both from the world and from one's own essence led him to conclude that the external form of the novel is, quote, essentially biographical, unquote. He found this statement to be true precisely because in both genres, the conceptual frame of the work can never perfectly and completely capture life, and the life being described can never achieve the inner wholeness that is reserved for the heroes of epic poetry. In the fallen post-epic era, to quote uh, Lukács once again, the very disintegration and inadequacy of the world is the precondition for the existence of art, unquote. And this assertion holds true for both the novel and the biography. Uh, Lukács' idea uh, concerning novelistic motivation 
uh, that the novel's protagonist must be driven by disharmony, and that that disharmony derives both from a sense of inner fragmentation and from a feeling of being out of step with the enveloping world, is equally applicable to the genre of drama. Indeed, if biography has a companion art form, just as poetry may be analogized to music, that companion art is acting. For in both acting and the writing of a biography, the artist attempts a deep dive into another person's consciousness, whether that consciousness belongs to a dramatic role or to an historical figure. Like the actor, the biographer examines words on a page and investigates the emotions and motivations that lie behind them. She seeks to determine by the most objective means possible how the author or speaker felt. Why, she asks, did the subject choose just those words to express himself? Does the character of the biographical subject respond to situations uh, and to other people? If, you know, how does this take place? In, in this seeking after feeling and motivation, the biographer is already filling gaps because the raw material of the historical record seldom serves to communicate the whole of the spirit's spirit, subject spirit, or intention. This is the first level of incompletion on which the biographer operates. A second encounter with incompleteness arises when, again, a la Lukács, uh, the um, biographer considers the subject as, uh, within the subject's own existence, a kind of author. Now, I'm not speaking solely of the biographical subject who literally happens to be a writer. Rather, I'm referring to the romantic condition of existence, wherein every subject regards himself as what Lukács uh, calls the uh, source of the ideal reality. Uh, when this self-perception takes place, um, the life as lived becomes akin to a work of literature, and the person living it becomes both the author of that work and the observer of its being created. This creation, however, is fated for disillusionment. As I've already suggested, and as everyone knows from experience, a shortfall always arises between the subject's ideal attainment of the objects of his various quests and the results he actually achieves. Thus, even a biographer's narration of what may seem like an ultimate success works best when, in keeping with realism, it preserves the shadow of imperfection and non-fulfillment that is present even in victory. As Lukács notes with regard to the novelistic hero, if this non-fulfillment of the biographical subject appears in no other fashion, it will still express itself in the inevitably failed struggle against the passing of time. As Hemingway observed, all true stories end in death, and the paths of glory that are blazed in a biography also lead at last to the slow walk to the churchyard. As if to parallel the necessary decline of human fortunes toward death, the writing of the biography is also a battle against the forces of time. This struggle is felt with particular force by the biographers of recently departed subjects, writers who must often scramble to interview surviving friends and associates before they too fall forever silent. But it is felt as well by biographers of subjects who are more remote in time. The biographer labors amid fragments. She strives to preserve them, and by publishing them to give them a greater durability, she hopes to slow the erosion of what can still be known, even as, day by day, history both creates and destroys itself. Biography adheres, adheres rather to the principle that the life ends not when the heart stops beating, but when the deeds and impressions of the life have faded from memory. Lukács confined his theorizing about alienation and incompleteness to the hero of the work, thinking to include the author of the text. It is a proposition too evident to require proof that writers tend to write because of a sense of insufficiency. They may write to understand some loss or vacancy, to address some inner hurt, or to try to adjust their emotional or intellectual relation to fit more snugly within the outside world. 
As the suburban homeowner vainly tries to fill the emptiness of his life with consumer goods, so too does the writer seek to fill up the voids in his or her own life with words. It's said that the late Robert K. Massey, author of the celebrated biography Nicholas and Alexandra, undertook that volume because his own son suffered from hemophilia. Massey took up his project so as to learn more about how parents respond to a child with that disorder. My own first two books each addressed a verbally gifted woman with a difficult and demanding father. I wrote about Louisa May Alcott and Margaret Fuller because they interested me intellectually, but also um, because both had to come to terms uh, with, a, uh, with a difficult father, as did I in my own life. Uh, and also, I wrote about uh, Fuller and Alcott to better understand the emotional and intellectual growth of my own daughter, who, not coincidentally, is an aspiring writer. In my most recent work, the theme of friction between fathers and children remains present, but it is, uh, I would say, somewhat less central. Arguably, the theme has diminished in importance for me because my father, who was alive during the uh, writing of my first two books, is now deceased. It's been glibly asserted that all biography is autobiography. A grain of truth inhabits that adage, and indeed the critic who seeks to craft a poetics of biography might well begin by investigating the lives of various biographers. What pains did they suffer? For what wrongs did they seek to be compensated or to atone? Uh, what voids did their writings strive to fill? What wants are voiced in a biographer's prose? Why did the biographer try to address those wants through writing instead of through action? The fullness of a biography, I would argue, is born out of absence and want. As the biographer writes to compensate for loss, she or he also writes to overcome separateness and to affirm his or her presence in the world. In every biography, there exists the potential for a dual assertion of romantic identity, for the spirits of both the subject and the author are constantly in play and in interplay. Indeed, biography as a genre inherently reflects a romantic conception of the self, because it very naturally sets a single person at the center of its reconstructed world, and narrates that self as though it were the most important being in that world. The biographical self, to paraphrase uh, Lukács, uh, posits a kind of idealized reality, implying that uh, this self is the material most worthy of realization. The subject's self is, of course, the sine qua non of the uh, biography. Uh, the protagonist resides at the hub of existence, and the surrounding world is of relevance insofar as it shapes, relates to, and reacts to this centralized figure. Indeed, it may be in this respect that the biographer fictionalizes uh, more than in any other way. In according such centrality to its protagonist, a biography partly assumes away the rest of the world. It neglects or obscures the truth that, at any given moment in its narration, worlds of activity are unfolding in which the subject has no position whatsoever. The fallacy of the centrality of the biographical subject is so ubiquitous that we barely notice it, and yet it matters. So too does the bias that draws many biographers to subjects whose claims to centrality are particularly strong. Some superb biographers, uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of my fellow Americans, uh, Robert Caro, David Nassau, and Ron Chernow, have made careers out of investigating the origins and nature of power. Perhaps more intriguing, however, are those biographers who seek out subjects who, because of race, gender, or other circumstances, are persons of limited power who must use their resources to carve out an effective space for themselves amid larger, often hostile forces. The ambitious woman, the gay man, the soldier on the losing side of a fight, all of these have their poignancy and grace. I've suggested that biography is a romantic genre, but the romance of biography 
is a thwarted romance. It is so because the self that is communicated in a biography is always fragmented and to a large extent beyond recovery. The narrated self is always a construction of exteriors. Biographers, in striking similarity to other human beings, are subjective. They observe, in fact, they can observe their subjects only with their own eyes and through the conditioning lens of their acquired knowledge of human nature. The biographer's subject, then, comes under the reader's eyes as an alloy, a mingling of the pure element with the self of the biographer. Indeed, if the biography is based in part on the accounts and perceptions of the subject's contemporaries, and this is almost invariably the case, the subjectivities of those observers also enter the mix. The result is that the subject who appears on the page inescapably stands at some remove from the actual person. Boswell's Samuel Johnson is not Johnson but rather an intermingling of Johnson and Boswell's interactions with and responses to him. Walter Jackson Bates's Johnson is a, uh, a formidable Johnson, but he is necessarily a mosaic, not a man, a composite of the perceptions of every source that Bates imply, employed, each of whom brought her or his own subjectivity to the dance. To purloin a phrase that Todorov applied to the Odyssey, biography is, quote, not a simple narrative, but a narrative of narratives." Unquote. Not only is the perceived and narrated subject a contingent creation, but one has to pause to think as well about the part of the subject that has gone through life without ever having been perceived, the unspoken thoughts, the half-forgotten dreams. Thus, one is aware that the full expression of a romantic, romantic self is thwarted in biography. The subject cannot be bodied forth as a romantic whole because the inner, unspoken movements of the spirit can never be recovered. Likewise, the spirit of the author asserts itself in limited form because the author is typically only partly visible, either in the wings or in disguise. Moreover, it's, uh, it is granted that the conscientious biographer seeks to suppress the self, leaving the spotlight to the subject of the book. Nevertheless, that subject is always present, and the book is the cryptic vehicle of its expression. Um, as I suggested, the famous life that the biographer describes is, even before that description has begun, a work of art, a deep and brilliant story waiting to be told. The biography is really the second telling of that story, since the first is the actual living of it. Through the subject, the biographer endeavors to explain the great to the ordinary, reminding readers that, for all of the similarities that unite all of humankind, the force that throbs within another person may be both qualitatively and quantitatively different from our own. At the same time, the biographer encodes his or her own thoughts and feelings into the text. As the biographer speaks to the audience, she is continually communicating herself along with the story she's telling, and continually using the biographical subject as a go-between in the conversation. A biographer typically spends years in crafting the eventually published narrative, thus a good deal of her life has gone into the work alongside the life of the subject. The biographer is an invisible but essential character in the drama. Indeed, it can be the heart, soul, and love that emanates from a biographer's being that can transform a biography from a dry account to a living work. Whether the reader ever breaks the code and recognizes the author's presence is of relatively little importance. The author knows how and to what extent her own identity is imminent in the work. Um, that knowledge, for most purposes, I would say, is sufficient. In this lecture, I have not met to place biographers on the same artistic level as poets or novelists. Frankly, I don't think we deserve to stand that high. A poet or a novelist may be a genius. The best biographer possesses only talent. Matthew Arnold was correct when he claimed that the critical power, and biographers are, in the final analysis, critics, ranks lower than the creative. But Arnold was also right when he said that creativity is a human being's highest function and greatest joy. 
we should not confine our definition of creativity to the work of truly great artists, those possessed of genius, because to do so would be to deny almost all but the most extraordinary people the chance to engage in that function and to feel that joy. The biographer does create, and in that creating, she not only feels that elation of creating, but offers it to others. Probably more than one biographer has drawn inspiration and comfort from Homer's Odyssey and the scene that follows close upon Odysseus's slaughter of Penelope's suitors. Unforgettably, the great hero spares Phemius, the suitor's minstrel, a sweet heaven-instructed bard has to survive in order to sing the songs of Odysseus's exploits. In Alexander Pope's translation, the poet pleads for his life by exclaiming to the great hero, quote, a deed like this thy future fame could wrong, for dear to gods and men is sacred song. Save then the poet and thyself reward, tis thine to merit, mine is to record. A biographer dedicates herself or himself to the proposition that there is also merit in the recording, that the historic deed remains incomplete without a singer to sing it. My own most recent book begins with an epigraph also taken from Homer, quote, let me not then die ingloriously and without a struggle, but let me first do some great thing that shall be told among men hereafter, unquote. The biographer takes up the same task, that telling, prying down the cruel and infamous, and creating a second life of honor for the great and for the good. Biographers sing long songs, bringing life to the dead through the writing and rewriting of the subject. Sometimes they have to work hard to stay on key, but when they do, they raise a hallelujah in which Leonard Cohen might have taken pride. niż w jakimkolwiek innym aspekcie. Zgodnie z, taką, z takim opozycjonowaniem bohatera, biografia obejmuje, ogarnia pozostałą część świata, ale też zaniedbuje bądź zaciemnia prawdę, że w dowolnym momencie tej biograficznej narracji rozwijają się różne światy wynikłe z różnych aktywności, z którymi Podmiot tej biografii nie ma nic wspólnego. Błąd polegający na scentralizowaniu pozycji podmiotu biograficznego jest błędem powszechnym. Ledwo go zauważamy, a jednak ma znaczenie. Podobnie jest z kwestią nastawienia, które wielu biografów przyciąga do tematów, o których potem będą pisać, 
nastawieniem o tym, że podmiot rzeczywiście jest podmiotem centralnym, jest, jest ośrodkowy dla, dla tej narracji czy dla wydarzeń. Niektórzy znakomici biografowie, tacy jak Robert Caro, David Nassau, Ron Cherna, zrobili kariery dzięki badaniu natury władzy. Być może bardziej intrygują jednak ci biografowie, którzy szukają tematów i bohaterów, bądź bohaterek, które ze względu na płeć, rasę lub inne okoliczności są ograniczone, osobami o ograniczonej władzy, osobami właśnie nie w pozycji centralnej, osobami, które muszą wykorzystywać swoje zasoby, aby stworzyć dla siebie, wyciąć dla siebie skuteczną przestrzeń, ścierając się często z większymi, nierzadko wrogimi siłami. Ambitna kobieta, gej, żołnierz po przegranej stronie, wszyscy oni mają swoją siłę i wdzięk. Zasugerowałem, że biografia jest gatunkiem romantycznym, ale romans, romans biografii jest romansem udaremnionym, ponieważ jaźń, która w biografii się komunikuje, która w biografii jest zakomunikowana, czy poprzez biografię jest komunikowana, jest zawsze fragmentaryczna i w znacznej mierze niemożliwa do odtworzenia, czy do odbudowania. Opowiadanie, opowiadane ja jest zawsze konstrukcją zewnętrzną. Biografowie są subiektywni, obserwują, mogą obserwować swoich bohaterów tylko przez własne oczy, przez szczególne soczewki, ich własne soczewki kształtowane, szlifowane przez wiedzę o ludzkiej naturze nabywaną przez całe życie. Bohater biografa pojawia się zatem przed oczami czytelnika jako pewnego rodzaju stop, mieszanina czystego pierwiastka z jaźnią biografa, taka fuzja horyzontów. Rzeczywiście, jeśli biografia opiera się częściowo na relacjach czy też percepcjach osób współczesnych bohaterowi, a takie jest prawie zawsze, subiektywność tych obserwatorów również w tę mieszankę wchodzi. W rezultacie podmiot, który pojawia się na stronie tekstu biografii, nieuchronnie znajduje się w niejakiej odległości, stoi obok, nie jest rzeczywistą osobą. Samuel Johnson Boswella nie jest Johnsonem, a raczej mieszanką interakcji Johnsona i Boswella z samym bohaterem i z odpowiedziami, reakcjami, relacjami, które jego dotyczą. Johnson, Bait to budzący grozę, grozę Johnson, ale z konieczności jest mozaiką, a nie mężczyzną, zestawieniem, złożeniem percepcji różnych informantów, z których korzysta Bait, a z których każdy, 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 każdy wniósł do tej mieszanki fragment własnej podmiotowości. Aby zapożyczyć sobie frazę, którą Todorow zastosował do Odysei, Biografia nie jest prostą narracją, tylko narracją narracji, wielości narracji. Nie tylko postrzegany i opowiadany przedmiot jest tworem przygodnym, ale należy też zauważyć, że przeszłość tego podmiotu, a przynajmniej spora jego część, pozostanie i musi pozostać zawsze niedostrzeżoną. Opisywany podmiot, opisywany bohater w końcu był także, doświadczał także pewnych myśli, których nigdy nie wypowiadał. Kształtowały go także na wpół zapomniane sny. W ten sposób można zdawać sobie, zdać sobie sprawę, że, że biografia udaremnia pełną ekspresję romantycznego ja. Podmiot nie może być ucieleśniony jako romantyczna całość, ponieważ te wewnętrzne, niewypowiedziane czy też niewypowiadalne ruchy ducha tego podmiotu są nam niedostępne i nie da się ich zrekonstruować. Poprzez duch autora występuje w ograniczonej formie, ponieważ autor jest zazwyczaj tylko częściowo widoczny. Niemniej jednak ta jaźń jest zawsze obecna, a napisany tekst jest nośnikiem ekspresji tej jaźni. 
Słyn, życie słynnego człowieka, słynne życie, które biograf opisuje, jest, zanim jeszcze ten opis, ten sam proces się rozpocznie, już jest dziełem sztuki. Jest głęboką, często błyskotliwą historią, która czeka na opowiedzenie. Biografia tak naprawdę jest powtórnym opowiedzeniem tej historii, ponieważ pierwszym, pierwszą instancją tej opowieści było rzeczywiste jej przeżywanie. W tym wykładzie nie zamierzałem umieszczać biografów na tym samym poziomie artystycznym, co powieści poeci czy powieści pisarze. Szczerze mówiąc, nie sądzę, abyśmy zasłużyli na to, by stać aż tak wysoko. Poeta lub powieściopisarz może być geniuszem. Najlepszy biograf posiada tylko talent. Matthew Arnold miał rację, twierdząc, że siła krytyczna, a biografowie w ostatnim rozrachunku są krytykami, jest w biografii istotniejsza niż ta, ta moc kreatywna. Ale Arnold miał również rację, mówiąc, że kreatywność jest najważ, najważniejszą, najwyższą funkcją człowieka i też źródłem największej radości. Nie powinniśmy zatem ograniczać naszej definicji kreatywności do pracy naprawdę wielkich artystów, ponieważ oznaczałoby to odebranie wszystkim, poza najbardziej niezwykłymi ludźmi, szansy na y, 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 zaangażowanie się w tego typu działania i odczuwanie radości płynącej z kreatywności. Biograf czy biografia rzeczywiście tworzy i w tym tworzeniu odczuwa uniesienie takie, jak odczuwa je artysta, ale także ofiaruje je innym. Prawdopodobnie więcej, wielu biografów czerpało inspirację z Odysei Homera i sceny, która następuje tuż po rzezi zalotników Penelopy. Wielki bohater, Odyseusz, oszczędza Femiusa, który był ministralem zalotników, to słodki, uczony przez samo niebo bard. On musi przeżyć, żeby móc wyśpiewać przygody Odyseusza. W tłumaczeniu Aleksandra Popa poeta błaga o życie, argumentując, że taki czyn byłby zły, dlatego że przecież przyszła sława twoja, Odyseuszu, będzie droga Bogą, a dla ludzi będzie świętą pieśnią. Ratuj więc mnie, uratuj więc poetę, a w ten sposób sam siebie nagrodzisz. Bo zasługi są twoje, a zapis jest mój. W zapisie jest zasługa. Historyczny czyn pozostaje niekompletny bez śpiewaka, który by go wyśpiewał. I moja najnowsza książka zaczyna się od epigrafu, również zaczerpniętego od Homera. Niech więc nie umrę w niesławie i bez walki, ale pozwól mi najpierw zrobić jakąś wielką rzecz, która będzie opowiadana ludziom w przyszłości. Biograf podejmuje święte zadanie tego opowiadania, wypłakując to, co okrutne i to, co niesławne i tworząc drugie życie e, 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 dla tych, którzy wielcy i dobrze okazywali się ludźmi honoru. Czasami e, e, praca, którą muszą wykonać, e, jest bardzo ciężka, ale kiedy ta praca się w końcu ziści, rozbrzmiewa aleluja, z której Leonard Cohen mógłby być dumny. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much. Szanowni Państwo, przepraszam, że, że, że te, 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 tak długo trwało moje tłumaczenie, ale to jest właśnie efekt tak zwanego site interpreting, czyli, czyli, czyli tłumaczenia z tekstu. Proszę Państwa, jeżeli Państwo macie pytania, będziemy bardzo wdzięczni za ich zadanie. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I do apologize that uh, I took uh, several minutes longer than Professor Madison. Um, these unfortunately are uh, uh, the pluses and minuses of uh, site interpreting, which is a, a rather difficult process and, and the text itself uh, was a demanding text. But uh, should you feel like it, uh, uh, we would be both delighted uh, to take your questions and uh, um, you can do it both in Polish and in English and I'll be translating into both languages. And, uh, and while people are uh, putting together their questions, I, I just want to uh, thank you, Professor Jenjeko, for uh, a, a performance of genius in um, you know, being able to uh, you know, assimilate, to you know, absorb and interpret and, and, and to translate um, 
in in a way that I I have every confidence was uh, was spectacularly good. So I I thank you very very much. I have my well, as is, always is, my respect is, and admiration. It is really not for not for me to judge, but thank you very very much. Uh, it is only very infrequently that interpreters actually are noticed or appreciated. So all the more grateful. I am Professor Madison. And we have the first question from uh, from Dr. Tomasz Grzoślewicz. Several years ago in Poland, uh, a biography of a well-known writer uh, has been published. The author of the book has described in it uh, certain uh, um, details concerning the intimate life of the writer, uh, including uh, details on uh, his extramarital relations. Uh, he the the author of the biography did not uh, disclose the identity of the writer's lover but uh, obviously uh, the identity of the writer's wife is publicly generally known uh, does this kind of incompleteness of uh, the message a biographical message is an example of uh, breaking the biographer's oath Well, you know, I I don't know what the precise terms of that oath um, might be. Uh, you know, when I talk about a biographer being under oath, you know, I talk about the um, the the obligation of of the biographer not to lie or to misrepresent. But I take that as being something different from telling all of the truths that a biographer may have unearthed. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that there are two obligations. Oh, okay. Odpowiadając na pytanie, za które bardzo dziękuję, chciałbym powiedzieć, że nie do końca jasne są chyba zasady tej przysięgi, pod którą biograf jako pisarz jest. Sądzę, że chodzi tutaj głównie o to, że podstaw podstawą jakby tej, 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 tej przysięgi jest to, że biograf ma nie kłamać, natomiast nie oznacza to koniecznie, że musi przekazać absolutnie kompletną i całą fakto, faktograficzną prawdę o swoim podmiocie czy o swoim bohaterze, ponieważ to jest jakby kwestia pewnej decyzji o charakterze Etycznym, jeżeli dobrze to zrozumiałe. Ok? Yeah, uh, I, to continue my response, I think that we ought to be uncomfortable uh, with a biographer who um, you know, unearths um, you know, uh, things that are damaging to living people under the guise of scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of so the best. Uh, Sądzę, sądzę że, powinniśmy, że, że powinniśmy być ostrożni w stosunku do biografów, którzy e, odkrywają fakty szkodzące ludziom wciąż jeszcze żywym e, pod płaszczem, e, e, pod płaszczem e, rzetelności dociekań, rzetelności badań humanistycznych, e, rzetelności naukowej. Mhm. Um, you know, one of the best commentators on this particular issue is a recently deceased American uh, writer named Janet Malcolm. You can translate that if you want. Jedną, jedną z osób, która podnosiła tę kwestię, była znakomita amerykańska badaczka, niedawno zmarła Janet Malcolm. Uh, and and she argues that um, that biographers who um, are are overly interested in dirty linen uh, are a kind of contemptible um, creature. Um, you know, in in that they um, you know, they 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 present the the prurient as uh, you know under under a. A, a presumed right of of the reader to uh, to know everything, and um, it's a question of you know, to whom do the facts of one's life belong, and individually we would probably say that our facts belong to us, but a journalist, 
um, a biographer is going to be inclined to say that no, that the facts belong to everyone. Once they exist, they are fair game. Uh, you can translate that and I have just a little more to say. Mm -hmm. uh, John Malcolm argumentuje, że uh, badacze, którzy czy biografowie, którzy są nadmiernie zainteresowani brudami w życiu swoich bohaterów, no to są osobami jakby nie godnymi, godnymi, godnymi politowania tak naprawdę, ponieważ pod pozorem przyznawania czytelnikowi prawa do wiedzy o wszystkim, do, do pełnej świadomości faktów, tak naprawdę rozgrzebują czyjeś życie dla celów, które zupełnie nie są z tą prawdą związane, dla celów prywatnych, dla celów sensacjonalnych, sensacyjnych, a więc także jakby dla własnego, dla własnego zysku. Trzeba sobie zadać jednak pytanie, do kogo fakty należą? Ja jestem skłonny twierdzić, że fakty należą do nas, że fakty są częścią naszego życia i to my powinniśmy być ich dysponentami, odkrywać je zgodnie z naszą własną potrzebą. Dziennikarz natomiast może uznać, że fakty należą do wszystkich, skutkiem czego będzie dążyć do przedstawienia ich i odkrycia ich jak najszerszej grupie odbiorczej. Mhm. Okay, I, I recently had an argument with another biographer, a friendly argument, um, in which she referred to biography as an irreverent art. And I like to stand up a little bit for, for reverence. Uh, I believe that um, it's, it's important for us to, um, you know, to, to represent our, our subjects accurately, but it's also important to uh, You know, when, when, the, when the person is fundamentally an honorable person, uh, I think it's important to preserve some sense of respect and admiration for, for, the, uh, for the subject. Um, that's a little bit old fashioned of me, uh, but I do think that um, you, you know, when one writes, one should not simply cast aside uh, one's fundamental decencies. I ostatnio miałem przyjemność wejść w taki przyjazny spór z innym biografem, który postulował taką prawdę, że, że, że biografia to jest sztuka prześmiewcza, czasami, która, która nie kieruje się poczuciem szacunku dla obiektu, dla, 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 dla swojego podmiotu. Ja jestem jednak zdania, że, że pisząc wcale nie musimy uciekać się do braku szacunku. To znaczy, że pisząc prawdę możemy cały czas zachować jakby podstawowe zasady etyczne, które mówią o nas samych przede wszystkim, wykazując się szacunkiem wobec, wobec naszego przedmiotu, wobec naszego bohatera. Taka kwestia przyzwoitości. Tak, jak najbardziej zachęcamy Państwa do zadawania pytań. Ladies and gentlemen, you're, you're uh, most welcome to, to ask questions. Szanowni Państwo, jeżeli nie ma więcej pytań, to chcieliśmy Państwu przepięknie podziękować za Państwa z nami tutaj obecność. No i oczywiście zaprosić Państwa 
na kolejny, ostatni już wykład z serii wykładów otwartych prowadzonych pod egidą Metropolii GZM, realizowanych przez wspaniałą Bibliotekę Śląską we współpracy z Uniwersytetem Śląskim. Szanowni Państwo, informacje na ten temat oczywiście będziemy Państwu przypominać na Facebooku i w różnych formach mailingu. Całą listę wykładów macie Państwo na stronach internetowych Uniwersytetu Śląskiego. Będziemy także informować Państwa, przypominając o tym na stronach amerykanistyki Uniwersytetu Śląskiego i na stronach Biblioteki Śląskiej oraz stronie głównej Uniwersytetu Śląskiego. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you very, very much for uh, being with us tonight. And uh, um, I hope, uh, I believe that Professor Madison is going to second me in that. I'd like to extend our invitation uh, to all of you to join us uh, um, uh, three weeks from now. Uh, um, uh, during the last of the series of open lectures uh, and let me just remind you that those lectures are live interpreted into polish but you can also listen to the uh, original uh, 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 to, to professor madison's original voice uh, without me disturbing uh, in the uh, youtube channel of the salesian library uh, i'd like to extend our uh, sincere thanks to uh, uh, our colleagues from the Library of Silesia, uh, um, um, to uh, the management of the uh, Silesian Metropolis and to the management of the University of Silesia. Professor Madison, thank you very, very much for, for this absolutely fantastic lecture. And before we go, there's one more question, um, a question from Karen J. McLean. In the process of doing your research on your subjects, Has there been anyone who surprised you in being completely different than you had thought them to be? Um, I think probably the um, the best answer to that is Louisa May Alcott. Um, in that um, I, I had actually not read a great deal of, of Alcott's work uh, before I started uh, writing her biography. And I uh, rather foolishly presumed that she was a Um, a soft, frilly, feminine writer of, uh, of stories for girls. And uh, at every turn, she, uh, she proved me, my suppositions to be completely in error. Uh, she's tough, she's feisty, she's athletic, uh, extraordinarily energetic, and, uh, and the first person to try to uh, throw off the, um, the, the sexist categories and suppositions that one might foolishly try to impose on her. Mm. Um, żeby, odpowiedzieć, żeby odpowiedzieć na to pytanie, um, powiem Państwu, że znakomitym przykładem takiego właśnie kogoś, e, kto stał się bohaterem mojej biografii i, i kto mnie zaskoczył tym, że okazał się zupełnie inny Niż, niż o nim wcześniej mówiono, była Louisa May Alcott. Kiedy zacząłem się przyglądać tej postaci, zorientowałem się bardzo szybko, że ten stereotyp Alcott jako takiej miękkiej, kobiecej pisarki powieści dla dziewczynek jest zupełnie nieprawdziwy, bo co rusz, kiedy odkrywałem kolejne fakty z jej życia i kolejne dokumenty, kolejne listy, okazywało się, że to pisarka zadziorna, że to pisarka twarda, a ostatecznie okazała się absolutnym zaprzeczeniem tych seksistowskich stereotypów, które jakby z rozpędu przypisuje się pisarkom tej, tej, tej epoki i tej generacji. Panie i Panowie, pięknie dziękujemy za pytania. Dziękujemy pięknie za wspólnie spędzony wieczór. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for all your questions and for the wonderful evening that we had a chance of spending together. Professor Madison, thank you very much. The lecture is absolutely fantastic. I can't wait until the next one.
Thank you very Dziękuję. much. Dziękuję bardzo. Dobry wieczór. Miłego wieczoru.